Commitment here this morning. It's wonderful. To you online, welcome to our Easter service. Let's all stand together. He is risen. Christ the Lord is risen today. So don't feel obliged if you're um, just here as a visitor for, for the baptism this morning. Uh, we just want to do that. So I'm going to have the ushers come forward, and we're going to pray and continue to worship our great and loving God. Let's pray. God, we want to thank you so much for this time, this season. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would open our hearts by your Spirit to hear your word together, to be able to sing and praise you for who you are, and also, Lord, um, that as we give out of the offering um, that we want to offer, that we would use that for your service and use it well and honor you in it. Thank you so much for the ability to gather this morning and celebrate with those who have made a commitment to you, and I just ask that you'd be with all the candidates as they are preparing um, during this time. So we give this time to you in your name. Amen. You can remain seated. How does it look, Howard? We're there? Okay, well, I think a lot of us know this next song. Uh, so let's stand together again. And uh, if you don't know the words, just, I guess, listen. <laughs> Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I 
I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. And I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me amen Above all 
rejected and alone like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me Rejected and alone like a rose Trampled on the ground You took the fall And thought of me above stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean oh how marvelous oh how wonderful and my song shall end My sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall end.
Matthew 28, verses 5 through 7. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name. in your name, Jesus Christ, my living 
Please be seated. Thank you. Wow. What a, I, wish, I wish people would sing a little louder. That would be great. What a, what a tremendous morning. It's great to see you all crammed in here. Uh, congratulations to all of you who got the tables first and uh, you're able to be here. We, we are um, in this morning of thinking about the resurrection, that Jesus rose from the dead, that he conquered sin and death. Uh, we want to just take a moment to reflect on that. And so let's pray that God would continue to work in our midst, that he would make this reality uh, real to us as well. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for your love for us, that you died on the cross for us, but we are so grateful that you rose from the dead, and we are so unaware sometimes that the power that raised you from the dead is available to us, and, uh, and yet we walk in our in our fears and our worries of each day, but Lord, thank you that you can speak into our hearts. By your Holy Spirit, you fill us, that we are transformed from the inside out. Not only are we, are we forgiven, but we're able to live for you. So I pray for those who are in the room today who are experiencing deep loss. I pray for those who are experiencing broken relationships. I pray for those who are concerned about their finances or their jobs. Lord, for those who have big decisions in the, in the days to come about treatments or about um, changes in their life, Lord, would you give them real clarity of mind, uh, peace in their heart. And Lord, we just pray that you would speak to us now as we open uh, your word. So we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I don't know if you heard, but we're having a baptism this morning. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's right. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, but uh, it's exciting to see people respond to what God has been doing in their heart and that they want to take this step. And, uh, and I was saying on Friday, I think we overthink it. Well, now I'm trying to, I'm really overthinking some things in my head about what the morning will look like, um, but I think we'll get there. It's just this idea that we have, we have made so much of, um, of things like baptism and different things. We, we have misunderstood, maybe, in our excitement to cheer it on and to celebrate what God is doing in people's lives, that we've maybe missed the point and forgotten that it's about Jesus who works in people's lives. And uh, it's about what he wants to do in, in each of our hearts. And so the step that different ones are making this morning is simply that, is simply, that's a loaded word, uh, it's, it's this act that is a demonstration of what God has already been doing in their life and what he will continue to do. And, uh, and so they take this step of obedience. That's going to be awesome. But I want you, uh, if you can, to turn to John 20. We're going to talk a little bit uh, through this passage this morning. But I need to tell you that um, throughout this PowerPoint that I have up here, you're going to see these little words that pop up, and it might look random to you, but to the children that are here this morning, this will make sense because Christine put together a, a package that they are trying to fill in some clues. So when you see the little leaf mark there, that is actually not for the majority of us. That's for the kids in the, in the audience that are trying to pay attention. Maybe you want those packets. I don't know. Um, we could give those away too. But today we're, uh, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's a day that we talk about him conquering sin and death, right? And we use this language a lot. They conquered sin and death. But over the last month, we have been talking in church here about going through a devotional series called Easter in the Everyday. And the idea of this is that Easter, or the resurrection, actually isn't just about one weekend a year that we think about this. This is something that should impact us every day of our lives, every moment. And, um, and so we've been trying to work through this. Um, 
this idea that, uh, that this is something that motivates us. So in the devotional book this week, they, uh, they had this question, how do we hold on to joy though this world gives way to grief? And so I was thinking about this idea, how do we hang on to joy? We just sang about the resurrection means so much, right? And yet, even in our own community in the last, in the last couple months, right? We've experienced such deep loss as we've seen young people who have been taken from us way too, way too early. And, uh, and so we're experiencing that loss. Some of you are gathering together as family uh, to have a meal, and there will be an empty chair or two around that table. And so you're experiencing the loss, the grief that is, is part of life, and yet what does the resurrection really mean then? Why is this important? It hasn't made a difference at all. In John 20, verse 1, and so there's Bibles in the, in the rows around you if you want to turn to this, but John chapter 20 says, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said, Jesus must rise from the dead. And then they went home. It's kind of an interesting statement. Basically, it means then they went back to where everyone was. But there's a lot going on here in this passage. First of all, remember that they had, been, uh, they had just seen Jesus uh, taken down from the cross. And they had done this in a, in a bit of a hurry because Sabbath was approaching. And in Jewish culture, once the sundown on, on Friday night hit, there was no more work that could be done. And so when Jesus died on the cross, the evening was approaching and they wanted to take him off the cross. And, uh, and so they, in a sense, hastily wrapped him and, uh, and put him in, the, in a borrowed tomb uh, before the time when all work should cease on Friday evening, which was Shabbat. So Mary returned with some of the other women early on Sunday morning, and uh, she was getting ready to finish preparing the body for burial. So these women, as you'll read in uh, other parts of the Bible, Luke chapter 8 is, is a story that talks about these women that traveled with Jesus throughout his life. But uh, the women had been loyal to Jesus throughout his ministry, and they had even supported him and the group with their own funds. So they're kind of a you know, non-profit society that went along, and they were, they were supporting the work that Jesus was doing with his disciples. These women had been at the cross, and while the disciples had faded away and left and were afraid, these women had stayed there and been with Jesus right to the very end of his life. And so they had witnessed their, their close, close friend uh, experience all kinds of abuse and torture. So you can imagine that all this was running through their minds as they approached the tomb to begin to prepare his body for more of a permanent burial. And you can imagine that what they were anticipating about what they had seen two days earlier and what they would find. But when Mary arrived at the tomb, it says, and discovered that the body was not there, she ran to find Peter and the other disciple. Now, when you read through the, the uh, Gospel of John, any time uh, John, for whatever reason, liked to refer to himself in the third person, he would say, you know, the disciple that Jesus loved. And in this story, he says, the other disciple. So this is John talking about himself. 
So as Peter and the other disciple, and uh, this news that Mary brought to them, it kicked them into action, and they ran to the tomb to verify. And what I find interesting in this story as well, if you look in, uh, I think it's verse 4, uh, John says, they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Like, why is that important, right? Like, okay, you're quicker, we get that. But just in case you were worried and wondered about this, in verse 8, he says, then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. So he's kind of a competitive soul, it seems like. But it was Peter who actually went inside, and he found that the linens were there, and the cloth that would have been wrapped around Jesus' head was neatly folded, but there was no body. It's important that we understand why John wrote this in the way that he did. First of all, in Jewish culture, a woman was not able to be a witness to anything that had happened. They weren't seen as a credible witness. It had to be two men. I'm just telling you what the culture was back then, by the way. Um, it was two men had to be the ones who would give testimony any kind of credibility. So the fact that Mary had to go back and get two disciples, two men to come back and witness this was important for John to include in the story. But then the fact that uh, having Mary there, um, it was necessary that they also would go in and verify this. And you know that John would have, at the time that he wrote this gospel, this account of Jesus' life, so he's writing it, reflecting back on what had happened. So as he's writing it, he's saying, um, he talks about the linen being there, and that the, uh, the head covering that was there around, that was wrapped around Jesus' head was neatly wrapped and folded, in a sense. It was neatly folded on the, uh, the, in the tomb. And this was because when you think about grave robbers who would have come, if somebody would have stolen his body, they wouldn't have left the linens there. They wrapped up everything and they would have taken everything and, and whisked them away, right? So there's little pieces of this story. It's kind of interesting that John was including this just to kind of go, okay, I know what you're going to say, but here's this, right? But then there's a very interesting line, and it's this, until then. John explains that it was only when he entered the tomb and saw that it was empty that he believed that Jesus rose again. For until then, they hadn't understood the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. And uh, as I was talking to some, and as we were preparing for baptism today in the last two, two days, um, as I was talking to different ones that were considering this, it was interesting to hear that there is this journey of faith that those who are being baptized have been on. It's like this other level of trust and dependence and understanding. It's like there's another layer that's happening in their lives. And that there's this, this sense of a, there's a growing sense of commitment. And that's the case for all of us. At least it should be this way, right? In our spiritual walk, for every one of us. That new lessons are learned. We grasp things in a new way. We go to a deeper level of faith and trust as we understand more of who Jesus is. So, I'm sure that all, uh, that at, I'm sure that we can all point, right, to moments in our lives when we would say, well, until then, I didn't fully understand, as you reflect back on your life. You think about a circumstance that happened. Until then, I only thought of myself. But now, I think of others. Until then, I didn't appreciate all that was given to me. Until then, I didn't realize how much God loved me. There's this, this growing understanding in our lives as we face adversity, as we face hardship, as we face joys and answers to prayer. Until then, I didn't really get it, but now I see it more clearly. That's what's happening here. So throughout our lives, there should be these markers of growth and understanding. In verse 9, for until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures. So we continue to seek out God. We continue to read his word. We continue to search out who are you, God, and what, 
do you mean? Well, the second thing that jumps out to me in this uh, story is the phrase, why are you crying? And um, it was in verse 11, Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped in, stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? And she thought that he was the gardener. Now, some people say, how would you, you know, was Jesus kind of disguising himself or what? But you can imagine, you came looking for a, a person who was dead, first of all. And that person, the last that you had seen him was as they were taking him off the cross after all that he had gone through. So what she saw, and now Jesus standing there, who one, one commentator said, you know, you have to think that if he, his resurrected body, when he died, he was 33, and what does, what's the perfect age for a resurrected body? I don't, I don't know. I would say it's 56, but most people <laughs> would say that it's like uh, 24, right? So even Jesus' appearance, I don't know where this commentator is going with this, but it was an interesting question. But the fact is, like, just she, she didn't even recognize him because this was just so out of her mind that, you know, like, how would this happen? How could, am I seeing things? Am I dreaming? What's going on? <clears throat> What's going on? And so then Jesus says to her, Mary, and she turned to him and cried out, Rabbi, which means teacher, or rabbani, which is like a, a, a warmer sense of, like, teacher. And then he says in verse 17, Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary, of course, wanted to cling on to Jesus, didn't want to let him go this time. And he's saying, you can't hang on to me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father, which will be so much better for you because then the Holy Spirit can be sent back. He also is saying an amazing thing. Find my brothers and tell them. Isn't that interesting that there's that sense of family, brotherhood, and he says, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. I'm ascending to my God and your God. There's now the statement that we have a relationship with God himself, that we are adopted as his children. This is the message that was being given to Mary. So Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And then she gave them his message. So Mary stayed behind, right, after Peter and John had left. And she was filled with sorrow and grief, of course. And I would imagine that in so many ways, this moment when they left and she hadn't seen Jesus yet, there's this tipping point of, like, just how much more can a person take? Like, she has witnessed this man who had made such a difference in her life. She's witnessed him be executed. She has now come to honor him by putting, you know, burying him properly and getting his body ready. And yet, he's gone. And so who can she go to? The authorities were the ones who put him there, that executed him. So how can she go to them and say, by the way, where did you put this man? So she has no one to turn to, right? So the authorities, she couldn't trust them in that situation. So she's crying for many, so many reasons. And there's this deep sorrow and brokenness in her life. This was another devastating chapter in the life that was so hard already. 
Mary Magdalene is a woman who, uh, with a very hard story. And there's been many legends about Mary Magdalene that, that have come out of Christian history. Uh, some have speculated about who she is in, throughout the Gospels. But what we know for sure is the one statement where it says that Mary Magdalene was a woman who had been possessed. That she had been demon-possessed. That she had been, and so this is where we fill in some of the story. When you think about somebody who has had this demon possession where she's been overtaken, she would have appeared to be someone who was out of control. She would have had um, mental illness, you know, would have been part of her story in, in such a profound way that she was out of control and nothing that she could do to, to in a sense, have, walk with dignity and, uh, and self-control. And so Jesus had freed her from this life and all the abuse that had most likely been part of her history. So she has a deep, profound love for God, for Jesus, and how he had changed her life. So it's no small thing that John when he's telling this story, made it clear that she was the first person to talk with Jesus. Think about that for a second. Remember about the whole credibility thing. So it's a woman who has been following after Jesus, is the first to hear, to meet Jesus, and that she is also the one who, um, who has had this, such a sordid past, Right? She had a significant value. She had been had such significant value that Jesus would show her attention when he comes back. The first person that we hear that he has talked to since he rose from the dead, and so he's shown her so much dignity and honor that no one else would have. Right, and and I think so much. This is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus being shared with us right now that Jesus would come to someone who had no way to earn his approval or acceptance and yet had dignity and value and worth that they were created by God for so much more than what they had found themselves doing. And so this gospel, this good news of Jesus, was that Mary was given new life because of Jesus. This is the good news about what he has done for all of us, right? That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That he loved us so much that he gave his life for us so that we could find forgiveness and healing. That song, sorrow and love mingled down. So much was happening. At first, the question from the angels and then Jesus, it could sound so obvious, like, why are you crying? You know, you're, in a, you're by a tomb. Why are you crying? What's the problem? And yet, it's not that kind of a tone at all. For shouldn't it be clear, her friend had died. She had experienced trauma witnessing his execution. And now, his body was gone. But these words aren't meant to be condescending. But they're actually ones of compassion, empathy. For Jesus was leaning in to help Mary see that her grief, her fears were being healed, that he was addressing all of these things in her life. Her eyes were opened as she heard her friend's voice. Everything had suddenly changed, and she had a whole new understanding of the power of God. So she went from devastation to hope. That death was not the end. The story was continuing that there was despair turned into joy, that there was grieving turned into dancing, and this idea that graves were turned into gardens, this idea that he could take what was so devastating, the death and injustice that happened with all of that, and that now there was new life. So here we are. Uh, It's over 2,000 years ago, right, that this all happened. And Jesus rose from the dead. Sin and death have been conquered, we say. So why is it that we still have to grieve and lose people? Why is there still so much brokenness in our world? And that is the question. Has anything changed, really? Well, it's N.T. Wright 
who uh, said this, it isn't that the cross has won the victory, so now there's nothing more to be done. Rather, the cross has won the victory as a result of which there are now redeemed human beings getting ready to act as God's wise agents. In other words, we are now, as we are changed and transformed, we are now agents of his bringing the good news of the kingdom of God that has come. And so we reflect his love to a world in need of hope. The good news is that we can be forgiven and accepted. That we can be called children of God. That he would say to us, I'm going to my father and your father. That's amazing. Yeah. So we begin to see that even in life's most difficult moments, there is a Savior who gave his life for us, who is leaning in towards us and asking, what is it that is making us sad? And then we hear his voice reminding us from John 16, 33, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Trials and sorrows. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. God has a plan even in the midst of our struggles and our hardship, our sickness, our grieving. The story is not over. And God is inviting us into a relationship with him. And the fact that he didn't allow, he said to Mary, you know, let me go, I need to ascend to the Father. What he's saying is, when he goes to the Father, he would then send his Holy Spirit, a comforter, one who would walk with us, who would fill us with God's very presence in our lives so that we could have courage, strength, when all hope is lost, right? Right? And so I know that there are people in this room who need to be reminded that the cross and the resurrection mean something. And in Ephesians 1, it's where Paul prays. He says, I I pray that the eyes of your heart would be open, right? That you would have this new spirit or understanding that, that there'd be this revelation that would come, that you would understand how much God loves us and wants to work in us. And then he says in verse 19, he says that you would then, um, he says the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us. And I know if you're like me, you don't always feel like you have that. And it's not like we wield a big old, you know, Thor hammer, you know, that, that allows us to just wield this power. That's not what he's talking about. It's about this inner strength that gives us resilience and ability to stand when all hope seems to be crumbling. Sets our feet on solid ground, lifts us up out of the miry clay, gives us a new song to sing, a song of praise to our God. Jesus, I pray that you will speak to our hearts, that you will... Help us to understand these mysteries in a new way, a deeper way. I pray for those areas that we've been hanging on to, thinking that we can solve it, that we will take care of these things when there you are wanting to offer us hope and strength and grace. Father, I pray that those who are in this room that need to understand that, that they would hear your spirit very clearly speaking to them and that they would know that you love them and that you accept them, that you forgive them. Help us to forgive ourselves and to accept your love for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, We're going to make a little bit of a shift here to the tank. And um, uh, here's, here's the thing about baptism that is interesting to me. So baptism is a statement, it was where um, 
It was, Liat was telling me about this. You know, in Jewish culture, uh, people are often uh, have a ceremonial cleansing, right? That was kind of a, a common thing back then. So when Jesus, you know, when, when John the Baptist came to baptize people, this was actually not as, as bizarre as it might feel like in North America. But having said that, it's in Ephesians chapter 4 that, uh, that Paul says that we have one spirit and one baptism. And I've been thinking about that. I was raised in a, a different tradition. I was raised in a tradition that thought that one, one baptism meant, you know, you do it once. When actually what that verse is really talking about is that what we are being baptized into is not a church, is not a, uh, you know, a denomination. That, by that I mean it's not being baptized into, you know, a certain thing. You actually are being baptized. It's about Jesus, Right? And so the statement that we're making this morning is that each of these people are saying, I want to follow Jesus. And so that's the statement that's being made. We are, the one baptism is that each of us who have been baptized, um, whether, whatever tradition you might have been in, whether it's, you know, Ephraim, Mennonite, or Baptist, or whatever, right? Like, if you were baptized into Jesus, in that sense, that you were declaring that Jesus is Lord, that's what he's talking about. Now, some people find themselves in a situation where a lot of life has happened since they were baptized. And they're kind of like, now how can I make this clear? And so I've, I've been growing in my understanding of this personally. But <clears throat> I think that there is a sense of, well, last week we saw it in a video um, when we were looking at the, you know, the journey through Israel. They talked about people being baptized in the Jordan River. And I've always wondered about that because so many people go to Israel and then they want to be baptized in the Jordan River. I'm like, but you were baptized. Well, that's actually what they're doing is they're, they're, the language that was being used is that they were, in a sense, um, recommitting their baptismal vows, you know, that they wanted to live for Jesus. And I think, well, what it is, it's, it's a statement that they want to live for Jesus, right? That they want to give their lives to him. And so I can't see that that's all uh, uh, a bad thing. So um, there's some who will be baptized who have gone through this. And the, there's a, a whole story that hopefully one day you can hear, but, uh, but not this morning. Um, the other thing is that there's some who are very young who are being baptized. And I have been talking to the parents as we've been preparing for this. And they have talked to their kids about this. And there's this deep understanding that Jesus died for them and they want to live for him. I was thinking about the jailer who, you know, after Paul and Silas were freed from jail, they, uh, they decided that they all wanted to be baptized. And it says the household was saved, that the household, you know, was baptized. And so that was all age and range there. And so we want to celebrate, no matter what age someone wants to to follow after Jesus, that we don't want to stand in the way of that, do we? And we want to celebrate that. And so that's what you're doing here today. So that's enough of the preamble. I guess I should take off my mic. Is that right? Um, the other thing that I'm doing is I'm, I'm throwing uh, Christine and, uh, and Jono. <laughs> this probably looks a little bit like, um, no, let's just, let's just keep, it, keep it going here. Um, the, uh, the thing is, um, I'm bringing uh, Jono and Christine into the mix here too. And Joshua is going to be uh, baptizing his son Abe. And uh, it's just a, a really cool thing. So how are we doing? Is everyone back and ready and we're doing this? All right? Okay. Uh, nope, we're doing it. <laughs> By the way, um, just another thing. Um, Everyone just relax a little bit here, and, uh, and this is going to be chaotic. Are we good with this? Right? Here we go. <laughs> yeah.
Okay, so yeah, Susan and Milan, you're, you're going to start us off here. Um, remember how on Friday we turned it on, we wanted to get the water ready? If we had a few jets, this is a hot tub right now, people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, there's a die in this. Just remember that. The, um, the thing is, yeah, I don't know that we're supposed to be baptized into this kind of comfort. <laughs> okay, Milan. So here's mother and daughter, Susan and Milan. And they have been baptized before, but they felt very strongly that they wanted to, uh, to do this with you as their church family, that they could be um, standing here and recognizing that God loves them, that he is working in their lives. So uh, let me ask you, there's two things that happen with baptism. First of all, we acknowledge that Jesus died for us and that he was raised to life again. And then the second thing is that we declare that we want to live for him. That's how uh, it talks about in Romans. Is that 9 or 10? I'm escaping on that one. But anyway, that we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and, uh, and that we live for him. So that's what we're doing. So it's as simple as that, not a long, uh, long speech, although I might throw the mic at somebody here just to stress them out. Uh, here we go. So... So do you believe that Jesus died for you? Yes. yes. And do you want to live for him? Yes. Well, upon your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, Susan. Same thing. You can... yep, there you go. Okay, Susan, do you believe that Jesus died for you? Yes. Yeah, and do you want to live for him? Yes. Okay, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Forgot to pack a snorkel. There we are. Yeah, so Abe Abe, uh, came to us after your invitation on the Good Friday service, and he said that he wanted to give his life to, or he wanted to be baptized. And what filled our hearts as we were talking about this with Abe is Jesus said, let let the little children come to me, right? And we asked him why he wanted to, and um, he said uh, that he... Jesus was baptized, and he asks us to get baptized. So I think that's pretty simple. So, yeah, that's about it. So do you want to do the actual? Oh, sure. So, yeah. Abe, do you believe that Jesus died for you and he rose again? Yes. And do you want to live for him? Yes. Yeah, well, your dad's going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You ready? You going to hold your breath? Yeah. One, two, three. Woo! Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, the jets aren't on right now. Um, so now, are we up to uh, the Freebles? Christine. And yeah, Pastor Christine is going to lead us through this. Um, you're going to give a message? Oh. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, she totally could. Thanks for yeah, exactly. Like Isn't that right? Like, yeah. I don't know. Um, so Christine, has, uh, she's been working with the Freebull family for a long time, uh, lots of discipleship and things going on here. So Christine, why don't you lead us through, if you'd like. Um, oh, you want me to do it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Come on in. This is Arthur. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Arthur is going to be the first of the Freebulls to get baptized. Yeah, come on in. See, it's warm, right? Do you want to stand there? Do you want to stand here so people can see it? Here, I'll switch around with you. 
think yeah. that would tell you. So, yeah. What's that? His, his dad's over there. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll, uh, yeah, so, so uh, Jonathan's here uh, to, to witness his family getting baptized, and uh, it's awesome to see these, these guys. They come to, uh, to church a bunch of times in a week, and they're involved in a big way in our children's ministry, and we just really appreciate having them in our congregation. So, Arthur, uh, do you believe that Jesus died for you? Yes. And do you want to live for him? Yes. Yeah, then Christine's going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you want to plug your nose? Yeah, there yeah. you go. Ready? Mm -hmm. We're going back. All right. <laughs> That's wrong, right? Okay. So, Brian. Oh, yeah. Stick around there, Arthur, if you want to watch, unless you're too cold. Come on in. So, Brian, do you believe that Jesus died for you? Yes. And do you want to live for him? Yes. Okay, Christine's going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Maybe yeah, you can go the other way if you want. Is that okay? That's awesome. Um, so you can see why Christine's been on the farm throwing bales around lately. It's a training exercise. So Nellie, this is the, the boy's mother, Nellie. Come on in, Nellie. And, um, this is a, here, or you know what? Uh, should I move? Okay. Um, this is a big step for Nellie, and I, you can ask her more about it um, as, uh, as she would like. But... Um, we are just so grateful, Nellie, to see God working in your heart, that he is, is restoring areas of your heart, that he's been working in your life, that he is renewing you every day. And I think that um, the step that you're taking is so awesome to see that God, God loves you. You are part of a larger faith family that is standing with you and your family. And so we, uh, we just appreciate having you around here so much. So uh, do you... So do you believe that Jesus died and rose again for you? Yes. And is it your intention to live for him through your life? Yes, it is. Yes. Who's doing this? You can do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. So Nellie, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let's, uh, let's go with Joel first. We've got the Reed family. So um, the Reeds are a uh, busy bunch. So come on in. You ready? See, isn't that nice? Yeah. Um, but we don't baptize with Sesame Street on No, I'm just kidding. Uh, oh, well. <clears throat> So the Reeds uh, have been uh, coming to church the last little while. They, uh, they're out on a farm near Cremona, and we just love having them part of this. You know that Phil leads worship often here and uh, having them a part of this, but um, we are just excited to see what God is doing in your lives. So uh, do you believe that Jesus died for you? Yes. And you want to live for him? I do. That's great. So I want to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'll go this way. Here we go with Evan. So, um, your dad asked that I would do this a little longer for you. Oh. So. <laughs> so, do you believe that Jesus died for you? Yes. And that, uh, and you want to live for Him? I do. Okay. Now, could you give a five-minute speech as to why? <laughs> so. so, I now baptize you in the name of the Father.
So Jill saw her brothers getting baptized and thought this would be a great time as well. Jill, it's awesome to have you here. Yeah, just make your way down. And uh, so do you want to take your glasses off? Sure. Um, that's good. Sure. So Jill, it's great to have you here. I know you've been involved in uh, children's ministry and helping out and stuff, so that's awesome. Um, so <clears throat> do you believe that Jesus died for you and rose again? Yes. And do you want to live for him? Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, one of the things that we do, we ask that question, it sounds like, oh, yeah, I want to live for him. We know there's hard days ahead for everybody, right? And yet we trust that God will be faithful. And Jill, he's going to be faithful to you. And so we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, are you coming in? Yeah. John is coming in. Right? I know. Tell him it's hot. I know. Trista. You can stand back if you want. My hands are wet. It's okay. Uh, so, Trista, since the time I got here, Trista's been the one wanting to kind of push the envelope and ask really, really, really hard questions, uh, which has been absolutely fantastic to see and participate in. It's been an honor. And a thing that's come up consistently was baptism. So knowing, like Colin said, that there are hard days ahead, it's, uh, it's awesome to see you take this step of obedience. So. So Trista, you understand that Jesus died and rose again to redeem you and reconcile you back to himself? I do. And is it your desire to strive to live for him every day after this? Yes, it is. Next, Bailey. The Spady clan, yeah. Three or four kids, anyways. We're coming for you, Weston. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Bailey, you understand that Jesus died and rose again to reconcile you, redeem you back to himself? Yes. And is it your desire to learn what it means to participate in his kingdom every day after this? Yes. Part of the key with this success is not having to do any public speaking, for sure. Uh, no. no speeches. Oh. Emma Spady, who's an excellent singer if any worship teams are looking for extra singers. Uh. <laughs> Emma, do you understand that Jesus died and rose again to reconcile you and redeem you? Yes. And is it your desire to live every day after this for him and participate in the kingdom? Ruben Spady. <laughs> Ruben, do you understand that Jesus died and rose again to absolve you of your sins and redeem you? Yes. And is it your desire to live every day after this for him? Yes.
I wasn't sure I was allowed to say the bit. Oh, oh. yeah. Well, you guys can come up. That's awesome. Like on they can, the. They can come up on the steps here, Bruce. Just watch the camera. Maddie. Hi. There you go. Look at that. You got a fan. Hello. I do. So Maddie, Maddie was super eager, you know, kind of the kid that it wasn't so much a matter of if she was going to get baptized as when, and uh, was kind of torn because, you know, felt compelled to do it today, but really wanted her sister to be there who was away at Bible College. And uh, so what did the good sister do? Drove seven hours down to be here today so that her sister could do this guilt free. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. So, Maddie, <laughs> do you understand that Jesus died and rose again to reconcile you back to himself? Yes, I do. And is it your desire to live every day after this for him? Yes, it is. Then I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Um, that's it, kids. <laughs> yeah, so last call, just before we pull the plug. Uh, Larry? Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Because <laughs> we, could, we could do this. Hey, so what you just witnessed was a step of obedience, and I think what we've been doing in the church over the years is we've wanted to have testimonies and big stories, right? <clears throat> the cool thing about that is that we are all encouraged by their stories. But I wonder how much sometimes we've been caught up in that and forgetting that this is about following Jesus. And so that's why the difference that we did today was that we wanted to make this about not so much about them having to stress about getting a song or a story or something like that, this is about Jesus Christ. And so now the work begins where we need to pray for them. Because how many times, maybe you have the same similar story, that after you're baptized, often that can be some of the hardest struggles. You think about Jesus. When did he face temptation? It's right after he was baptized. And so he went into the, into the wilderness after that. So may God spare them from those those deep times, but at the same time, maybe he's got something in store that he needs to do in each of our lives, right, after that. And so pray for them. Pray that God would continue to work in their life, that, uh, that they would persevere, that they would have the strength that comes by the Holy Spirit working his grace in their lives. And, uh, and so we just pray that God will, will follow that through in their lives, and we look forward to seeing how he's going to use them in the days to come. Larry. Let's all stand together as we close. He is risen. Amen. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive, alive forevermore. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. Jesus is alive.
coming to celebrate he is risen I also always say that sometimes we don't get to hear the story but I'd encourage you if you can find one of these people um, after the service who got baptized and just say hey how did you get to know Jesus or what's he been doing in your life lately I think even a younger person can answer that question so um, encourage you to do that uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, and may he turn his face before he, to you and give you peace. You are dismissed. Blessings on you. Mm -hmm. 